VIP access. VIP access with Aniko and Africa Loud. Welcome back to VIP Access. This is home to your favorite personalities. And today I'm having a multi-talented artist. She's also a copyright and intellectual property specialist and lawyer. She also is a musician, thespian, actress, improv comedian, entrepreneur, super curator, really has curated dope events and gigs. Welcome, June Kashui. Thank you, Aniko. So nice to be here. Oh, it's so nice to have you. Oh, my God. I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 always, I'm always kind of, um, um, what's the word? Like, I always still get so excited to be around you, even though I've been around oh, you so for many a long times. time, yeah. But I think it's just how talented you are and just how you carry you with yourself so much light mm. and power mm. that always amazes me. Thank you. Yeah, you're Thank such you. a powerful light. I like, always I like been. that. I like that. I'm going to add that to my CV. Yeah? Yeah. At the end of all the little acronyms that we put powerful light. Right? I like that. I like that. Thank you. I like that. <laughs> and, I, and I always say, like, many people are many things, mm. but, you know, what really is... For me, about June, I just find that you're such a powerful light because you are a powerhouse mm -hmm. of everything you do, mm -hmm. but you also like to shine light on other people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I even like, you know, what you've done with your gigs, uh, yeah. Motown, The Hang. Yes. For an artist to be so selfless, to come out them of themselves and create platforms for mm -hmm. other artists, mm -hmm. collaborate with other artists, it's just something amazing. Yeah. So... No, Thank I, you. I, I, you're very welcome. I'm, I'm grateful I've had that opportunity and continue to have it. Um, for as long as there's all this amazing talent, you know, um, most of these guys we work with now are half my age at this point, you know. And I keep thinking, like, when I was starting out in this space, we weren't that many, you know. And so you kind of, like, took your little corner of the world, uh, took your little corner of the gig space, and then you would literally try and flood it with as much June as possible. Mm. And then now I'm finding that as time goes on, we, our society is more um, open to having people within the creative sector openly come out and say, this is where I earn my money. This is where I trade professionally. And then what we're missing, in my opinion, is platforms. We're waiting for that one corporate to have that one gig a year mm. who will then only be able to host maybe five artists. And here we have 25 or 100. And so where do we, where do we find these other opportunities? Um, and the second thing was just it was so much more fun to have more people on stage. <laughs> with, I'm just like, this is so cool. I get to dance with these guys. I get to sing with these other people. So I think it also keeps me happy, keeps me young, keeps me fresh. Mm. Um, so I don't ever get bored when I'm in this sort of creative music and performance That's space. dope. That's yeah. dope. Yeah. I know that the events world is not easy. At all. So how have you managed to, you know, create your platforms, <laughs> brands, and keep them going? Yeah, um, yeah. Are people, in your experience, like people who come to your concerts, like do they all buy tickets or yeah. do you have to get partners and sponsors? I mean, you always have to get partners and sponsors, but what has really made you move forward with the yeah. platforms and the, events? The, the truth is, Aniko, I have partners mm. way more than I have sponsors. Oh. Um, and the difference between the two is um, provider of stage lights and screens, for example, would normally charge, for argument's sake, a million bob. Um, but I tell him, I'm not a corporate, I'm not able to afford that, but I think this gig is really dope. And if we can do these six events in a year together, then we all make a little bit of money, but don't completely finish what's in my kitty. Yeah. And that's how I approach the partner. Mm. And the guy goes, okay, fine. I'm knocking off 70%, pay, pay 300K and we're good. For example, right? Yeah. Um, tent person says the same thing. Um, hey, I've seen the way the clouds are looking. I'll give you the tents for three extra days for you to set up so everything is covered and I will only charge you for the gig day. Mm. That's a partner. A uh, sponsor is where I think a lot of us event people run to to get actual cash. It's very difficult in Kenya to break even or make money from an event um, especially if you're trying to improve and grow and give your audience a different experience each time, because I really think that's the thing that keeps our audience coming back. We never do the same thing 
ever. Mm. And so they're always like, ooh, what's going to happen this time? What's the new thing that's going to be added? A new artist, a new piece of deco, a new thing on our set, the choice of music. We never repeat anything. And that's, I think, something that our audience have truly appreciated. And they feel they're getting value for money mm. um, every time they come for our events because of that. The partner out is the way to go. And if you're able to secure uh, your social capital, it's actually the biggest asset that I have right now um, that I'm able to call people and say, if you believe in making magic with me, um, I can't do it alone. How, if we work together, what can we achieve? Uh, sponsors are great. When they do come through, they give you cash. But cash is not always the, the only thing because I think people then run, get the cash, and then the quality of what we see on stage but it gives you uh, more resilience when you don't have the cash and you can still make magic. Of course. Wow. That's mm -hmm. the best thing I've had since I could remember. Social capital mm. will always trump the money. Always. Always. Money is great, but I can't tell you that I have had it. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> sometimes I, I go, I'm like, how did we pull that off? I don't even know. I don't even know. It's God and, and social capital. Yeah, mm. amazing. And and for those who are listening, because this podcast's um, uh, biggest listenership actually uh -huh. is um, out of East Africa is Ghana, nice. South Africa, Mauritius, and Senegal. The podcast is also syndicated on a Ghanaian TV channel. So oh. could you explain? Hi, to Africa. <laughs> It's so dope that Africa is listening. Africa Could is you listening. Could you explain to, to, to them, like, this event that, you know, you curated and okay. Uh, created? Okay. So because I have, you say none is, not one event is, not is one event similar is to same. another. Yes. So at the moment, we have five properties. Um, the first is Motown in Nairobi. I'm calling it the first because it, it's t 10 years old this year. And it's basically music from the record label that was, is known as Motown. <clears throat> and we started uh, sort of showcasing that music because there was a demographic of audience members who asked for something for their age group. Of course. And so we listened to the feedback of our audience and we put something together for them. It got such wonderful reviews and we started doing it a couple of times a year. Um, and the second property we then uh, curated was the Tribute series, which is, um, you know, departed legends and living legends. So um, African musicians, um, your, the likes of Whitney Houston, Luther Vandross, Aretha Franklin, Stevie Wonder, who's a living legend. And we've done uh, enough of those um, over the years. I think the first one we did was probably in 2015. Um, and what that has helped us to do is to honor the people who have um, poured their music into our lives as musicians and have um, influenced our musical canvas. So you hear that uh, song, I Want to Dance with Somebody, and you can remember exactly where you were. And if it's happening for us as musicians, it's happening for the audience. And so we are able to connect on that level. The third property is called uh, The Hang, which is a 90s throwback. And now we've started moving into the early 2000s as well. But basically just good vibes. Uh, we celebrate the lingo when we were all growing up. We used to say, I'm going to The Hang. And not that The Hang was an event. The Hang was an experience. You'd go to a, a venue, a nightclub. You'd go hang out with your friends and you'd go out. That was called hanging back in the day. So we thought, let's reclaim that, that uh, terminology and it's a live performance with choreography, wardrobe, everything. And, and then we have two DJs who've partnered with us since the very first edition. Uh, we launched our newest baby this year called The Bear Sessions, um, which is a really stripped down um, uh, interpretation of uh, original music. Uh, we launched uh, the first session with Sage. And we basically had arrangers rearrange her music, give it back to her. And we performed it completely acoustically. No, nothing was plugged in. We had, uh, I think, only the guitar. Everything else, we had a grand piano instead of a keyboard. We had no tracking. Uh, we had a string quartet. We had a horn section. Um, and it was beautiful to see what our own Kenyan music can sound like when we have the freedom to add all these beautiful elements to it. So those are the five properties that we're working with now. There's a one that we do because it's important to give back. I produce the Love Zone for the Rotary Club of Langata. It's a fundraiser event that we produce for free for them um, so that they can raise money for school fees uh, for about 50 children 
that they that they support. So we do it around Valentine's Day, and whether you are with somebody or you are looking for somebody, and you can come and sing along to some beautiful love songs. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot. It's a lot, <laughs> and and you still manage to have your day job and many other jobs because yeah. you don't have just have, don't have just a day have job one. you're you yeah. know also a radio presenter at capital i'm i'm very lucky to have you here right now because capital <laughs> just moved studios and yes. i'm not sure if you everyone is on air yes. but june is usually hosting their jam which is really cool and then you are also an ip lawyer yes. so how do you <laughs> actually end up getting time to do all these things do mm. you have to wake up very early yeah. or how do you yeah, I think the Manage. thing I've sacrificed is sleep. I think uh, <laughs> we will sleep when the time is, is <laughs> given to us to sleep. Um, and I nap a lot when I'm able to. But yeah, I wake up early. I, I try and um, allocate four hours a day to everything I do. Not more than four hours. Because I think after that, I'm really not productive. Wait, wait. Only four hours for everything or each? Four hours per thing. Per thing. Yes. Wow. So it's a, it's a thing, I, a theory that I'm testing out called the block of four. Uh, and it's actually radio that taught me that because my show is four hours long. From three to seven, whatever we need to get done has to get done between three and seven. Mm. The value of 30 seconds. Uh, a quick link before the news. Mm. News has to run at five. If it's five, it's five. You can't be talking at yeah, <laughs> five yeah, o'clock. Yeah, yeah. You the must news have reader. finished your point. Right. <laughs> so it, it gave me a completely different perspective on, on time and how to manage it. So I thought, okay, if I'm this effective for three to seven, why can't I apply the same sort of energy focus for four hours for all the other things that I do? So typically, if, if everything goes according to plan, six to ten is the first block of uh, of four. I'm usually trying to have my own window of time. I'm still in my PJs. I'm having my coffee. I do my prayer. I'm on my laptop trying to read through emails, finish reviewing that contract that I fell asleep trying to work on the night before. And it helps me to just get myself ready. From 10 to 2, I'm open to meeting my clients. I'm in my office. I'm at my desk with my team. If there's anything we need to work on, uh, meet a new client, whatever it is. So that's sort of like JGIP consultants time, which is the name of my firm. And then I leave at two because I need an hour with this hour, beautiful Nairobi traffic to get to the studio. And then that's sort of like lunchtime, make calls, check in with family, uh, catch up with a friend. But as you're in transit, wow. three to seven is the radio show. That's another block of four. And then seven to 11, you could either go have drinks with a friend, go for dinner, go to the gym, go work out, go for a walk, or get back on your laptop if you didn't finish and your brain is clear enough to come back and, and, and tackle. Or if we have a production, I go for rehearsals. Rehearsals are usually 6 to 9 p.m. if we're able to, to get everybody on a day that doesn't have a gig. Um, yeah, so that's sort of what I'm testing out. Does it work perfectly all the time? No. But it's definitely made me more intentional about, you know, um, giving everything a little bit of time every day. And I think um, sometimes you really have to find how to give everything its own time. Because yes. if you don't, there are certain things that might take more time. Correct. Or some things that will fall. Right, <laughs> through the cracks. right, yeah. right. Yeah. That's quite interesting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because June, you do a lot. You do a lot. You yeah. are such a powerhouse. Um, yeah, and you're but also a musician. Don't, don't you think we have time? You do a lot. You do a lot. Don't you do a lot? You do a lot too. I do a lot. Yeah. I do a lot. And I also try to have some sort of planning. For yeah. instance, people want to meet with you every day. I'm sure mm. you have clients who have contracts to show you, have consultations. Yeah. And they I can't just take yeah. consultations every day, anytime. So I have to check my week and check my days. And I usually tell them I can't have this kind of consultation days back to back. Yeah. I also need time for myself and to, to actually do the sit work. down and do the work yes. because meetings and consultations, I feel like that was some work, but then also some work wasn't done the whole day because True. I can't be consulting and at the same time doing desk, a PR report. Your desk is still looking right? like this. So yeah. I, I always have to go out and then get, get back and finish the actual desk work. So yeah. I think and you have life happening while all this is... That too. We haven't <laughs> even talked about family and all those other things. Exactly. And that's still happening. Yeah. Um, the other thing that has helped me a lot is delegating. And that was hard because my personality is such that I usually do the thing myself because I mm -hmm, I want to do it myself. And yeah. I don't really, I didn't have a lot of grace for mistakes. 
And over the years, I've learned that that's the thing I've had to work on the most. So now I have teams. I have teams at JGIP Consultants, the firm, um, who work on, like, I can meet the client the first meeting. I'll introduce them to my mm -hmm. associate and say, you may not always find me, but so-and-so can handle you perfectly. If you have an issue, let me know. And we move on. Uh, same thing with the event side. You know, we'll do a site visit with my team and I'll tell them, okay, that's the manager of this venue. That's the person in charge of security. We have the first couple of meetings and then I hand over to them. Um, that was really difficult to trust another individual with your vision, with your dream. Yeah. But there's no other way for no. it to all work. There's absolutely no other yeah. way. I also came to learn the same because, first of all, one person can be at four different places at the same time. Yes. And then if you want to do something at different times and do something else at different times, someone has to be handling the other thing. On your behalf. You know, yeah. I wouldn't even be sitting here if I didn't have my team, you know, doing the PR stuff because I would have to be there. But thankfully, there's now a team to mm -hmm. help me to move on and do to other do things. The things. Yeah. 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 But I, I want to say um, I love this June, mm. even more than the June I fell in love with, <laughs> because we got to know each other back then when I used to work at KBC. Yes, I um, remember. Hosting an entertainment show called Grapevine, and it was really happening then, yeah, you know. It, I yeah. think jazz was You've really... You've been happening I... then, my God. <laughs> you were like having this... You saw this thing before I a did, lot of people I did. I did, yeah. Yeah. I did. So, and sometimes I feel like even though I'm, I'm now podcasting and podcasting is the in thing, I'm just like, I just feel at home because... This is exactly where I started. Yes. You know, that's how I got to know June. Yeah. And I always remember those days so fondly because they really formed my love for Nairobi, for, for our culture mm. and for what's happening locally. Mm. From seeing you perform alongside the likes of um, Aaron Dreambui, yes. um, Kas... Uh, uh, Eddie Ka Gray. Eddie Gray, not um, Kasiva. Um, Kavuda. Kavuda, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. so that was really cool. And w when I when I went into you at the other event and I said, June, will you come to my podcast? You said, of course I'll come. <laughs> yeah. The first thing that came to my mind was um, jazz and copyright with June. And I was like, you should have a podcast <laughs> called Jazz and Copyright with June because you are actually such a wonderful jazz musician. Thank you. But uh, the interesting thing right now is you have really created just this empire mm. and now people know June for all these different type of things and I love that because you've you've always been more than just jazz mm. but then you, you were more plugged in the jazz scene and now you're True. curating all these events which are and different genres right? as well yeah. so I really yeah. love that June but yeah. I, I still miss you miss the ju jazz, jazz June yeah, jazz. I remember I used to bother you. <laughs> Sometimes we used to meet at events. I'm like, when is your next jazz event? Yes. You're like, I look at the other things I'm doing. True. But I, I think also that that was um you know how things are circumstantial sometimes. So at that time when we started these live performances and these gigs, this is what the clients would ask for. Jazz was equal to non-intrusive, non-bothersome music or unbothersome, whatever the English word is. So people could come for their cocktail event, they could engage, they could have a conversation, and there's jazz, oh, it's nice and it's quiet, and it's um, it gives you a, a nice vibe, but it's not in your face. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of clients, I think, gave us as much work as they did, because um, they were looking for that kind of entertainment, as opposed to this thing that makes you stop what you're doing, sit down and it's a show, you have to watch us, yeah. you have to listen to us, you have to be aware that we're in your space, in your building, in your house, in mm. your office, right? Um, so I think it was almost by default that there were, there were that many sort of jazz events at the time. Um, and I do think it's a natural progression because even jazz right now feels like a, a sort of a, almost elitist kind of like very specialized uh, sound. But it's, it's, there's been a lot of festivals that have helped to bring jazz, let's say, to the people. Of course. So it's made it more accessible. And from jazz, there's sprouted all these different, you know, genres that have infused some jazz of elements course, yeah. but also other sort of cultural elements as well. So I think it was a really lovely um, sort of uh what do you call it? A launch pad. Yes. Um, but I still I still love my jazz standards. I won't lie. Like jazz gigs for me are always like fun. Really? Um, when guys are having dinner, we played for a, a client the other day. There were only 16 of them. 
And so, of course, a lot of the, the initial sort of music that we did for the first 30 minutes was just nice jazz tracks. It's good vibes and it's so super sexy. Yeah. And, so nice. and sometimes <laughs> I feel like, uh, I don't know, I, 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 you guys enjoy, I mean, you guys, the jazz artists, sometimes yeah. I see you even kind of start to do improv. Yeah. 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 It's scatting or yes. sort of like you, because you, jazz frees you, right? It has, it has form. But then it also doesn't have form, right? Yeah. So if somebody starts playing something, you can't really rehearse. You'll just say, I'll take a solo. You don't even know what that solo is going mm. to sound like because maybe you're feeling sad and you'll sing more, I don't know, minor notes or something. Um, but yeah, I think that's the freedom uh, a performer, I think, really craves for. Um, that yes, there are things that are rehearsed, but then the, you also want to sort of break free from that mold mm. every so often. But yeah, jazz does that. That's so dope. <laughs> and I'm so happy for all your friends in jazz because everyone seems to, you know, be doing their doing thing. Well. Yeah. Kavuda is now uh, running an events company, which is super successful as true, well. True. Um, I know they worked with Saudi Soul for the Soul Fest. Mm -hmm. Um, Aaron is touring the world with Tiwa and also Look having his that. own shows in New York at yes. this jazz cafe. I'm yeah. like, go you. Yeah. This is exactly where you were supposed exactly. to be at this time. Exactly. The whole lot, I think. Um, I, I was in Diani the other day and I met up with Crispy Talk, who's also oh, still nice. another his legend. saxophone, another legend. So if I think about those guys we were performing with 20 something years ago. This is this is uh, it's really it's really refreshing. Lawrence Mwai, Eddie Gray, who's still doing his amazing yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, currently, I think in Turkana, doing some really yes, cool some content. Yes, really cool content yeah, with the Turkana so, artists. Yes. But what do you mean twenty years ago? <laughs> what? Yep, that's how long it's been. That's really? how long it's been. My first ever gig with I think Lawrence Mwai was in. Um, oh my God, it was twenty something years ago. I think I was. Maybe nineteen. You really like started that. young. Yeah, you're really singing jazz I, at nineteen. Yeah, Eesh. I started, <laughs> and we sister, would sit there sister. and rehearse. Let me tell you, rehearse. Hey, yeah, it's it's been a beautiful journey. It's been a beautiful journey. I think music has been the the arts have been a part of my life for so long. Yeah, it's like a, the other supply of oxygen. Of for course, me. Yeah. it's 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 really your DNA. Yeah. Yeah, it's not yeah. something you can detach yourself from. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Nor am I trying to. Same here. Mm. <laughs> even even the legal side have had to accept yeah. that Akoivo too. She's just like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, before we wrap up, I think it's very important to also touch on copyright and mm. intellectual property. Ataka my just kidogo, because that's obviously something very important, especially yeah. for artists and creatives, yes. even businesses to know True. what what does what does that mean for True. you. True. Um, so, in layman terms, <laughs> what is copyright and what's IP, and mm. why is it important for 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 whoever is listening if they are if they have any creative cr creative things that thing, they have idea yes. product whatever yeah, yeah okay so so the the overall uh, sort of phrase is intellectual property or ip so that's the discipline within law um, that helps us to protect the, the creations of our mind and what does that mean it uh, focuses on intangible property things you cannot see feel touch we can see and touch this microphone this table this chair these earrings but the artistic sort of intangible side of a song of a movie of a book the story and the journey it takes you on of art that you see on a wall you know um, or even something like this this thing that is holding the microphone it's a, it's subject of intellectual property mm. so intellectual property is broken down into two Copyright is one, and industrial property is the other. So copyright will cover music, literature, um, audiovisual works, film, um, visual art, uh, photography, um, and elements of fashion, software, because software is written code. It's actually a literary work, like a book. In industrial property, we have things like um, uh, things that are invented, for example, like, again, the microphone, uh, the laptop, through which the software will work mm. to make the thing make sense. A lever, pulleys, um, pharmaceutical uh, sort of drugs and things like that. Mm. Uh, so it's more industry, in used in industry. Mm. Trademarks, for example, and we're having a very interesting debate right now in our country about trademarks and what can be trademarked and what cannot. So how are you known? 
to your audience, to your clientele, to your customers. So that's what IP um, helps us to protect. When you are trading, you must decide, am I offering a good a product or a service, or am I offering something that could be considered art? That will help you know which side of IP you fall. Because there are people who say, I want to patent my TV show. I want to patent my podcast. You can't do that. Patent doesn't cover uh, uh, creative works. Copyright mm. does. Trademark will cover the name of the brand. For example, Aniko or Oko is, is the name of the brand. Mm. That is what we would trademark. Okay. But patent and uh, geographical indications and utility models all under industrial property. So for those in the creative space, you are squarely under copyright. Yes. You want to register your work, your songs, you want to enter into agreements with the people you collaborate with. Um, if you're part of a record label, or if you're part of a writing residency, these are questions we must ask ourselves right at the outset, not when the song is popular. This is where even signing the split sheets come in. Split sheets help you know who played which role. Mm. Uh, Aniko wrote verse one, June wrote verse two. We collaborated and both wrote the hook. And then somebody walked in and said, hey, I'm, I was listening to you guys and I want to suggest this for a hook. Yeah. All four of us, all three of us now become rights holders mm. within that song and the split sheet should correctly indicate before the song has gone anywhere, before it's released, before it's published, before it's on air or on any DSP platform, you want to document this. Yes. Most of the royalty collection, collection bodies will also ask you or should also ask you for these documents mm. so they know who to pay the royalties to. Think of... Um, Nollywood, Riverwood, all our woods, eh? Hollywood, wanting to use some of this music for their for their um, uh, soundtracks. Who are they going to call if they want to license the music? So documenting this right it's at the beginning very important. is extremely important because music doesn't just live, uh, you know, on your on your phone, on your uh, gadget. It could travel. An orchestra in China might say, I want to perform that live. We've seen our, our Swahili version of the, uh, the Lord's Prayer being performed by choirs in the Far East. How the heck did that happen? Somebody may have licensed mm. or may have given transcribed sort of music sheets to them to perform. But some money should have then come back um, from those ty ty types of exploitation. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing that artists need to remember around uh, intellectual property is trademark. A lot of our artists have pseudonyms, they have stage names, and then we see them producing merchandise and selling the merchandise. Why don't they trademark their name? We've got a lot of those artists in Kenya whose business names are known names, record labels, you know, the Ogopa DJs of this world, and an artist like Nameless who has a name, but his stage name is Nameless. If he wanted Nameless merchandise, that's the kind of thing you would then pursue a trademark registration mm. for that then secures you for 10 years to exploit that exclusively. So I think artists have a responsibility not to become lawyers, but to understand how this um, intellectual property rights can help them exploit and monetize. That's what we preach at JGIP. You create, you protect, you exploit, and you monetize. Mm. Yeah. So I think it's really important. That is so important. Yeah. And, and, and we were discussing this also before this podcast, just saying like it's crazy because this information has been out there, but uh, it's almost like no one is listening. Yeah. There still needs to be more of this information. And that's part of the reason why we're even having this discussion. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know I if they get avenues, it. More avenues, more avenues for them to hear it. Yeah. And more avenues for them to know where they can access it. Mm -hmm. The truth is, and you got my my honest opinion about us humans and us creatives, I'm including myself in that mix. Yeah. Is that until it has bitten us in the behind, we are not going to do anything about it. So when you have a challenge is when you go, oh my gosh, there was some copyright thing I heard about somewhere. Yeah. At least at this point, my, my, I've settled on, they know where to go to get the help that they need. Mm. They may not sit with the information and understand it the way an IP lawyer mm. like myself does. And that's fine. An awareness that there's something called intellectual property, and as an artist, I need to know what, One, two, where three. my copyright lies and what did I give to so-and-so and what does licensing mean versus what does... Uh, you know, transferring rights mean, if I at least have a general understanding, I'm good with that, right? I've made peace with it. Mm -hmm. So I think to all the artists listening, you, you have a responsibility. 
It's not somebody else's job to come and pick you up. But if we have spent all these years studying <laughs> um, and we have podcasts like yours that make people know you can access this information here, then I think we've taken a stride. And there's the Kenya Copyright Board as well. In each of these African countries, there is a copyright body. Mm. In Ghana, there's one. In Nigeria, there's one. In Uganda, there's one. Um, in Tanzania, there's Kosota. In South Africa, there are several. So you can go and get information um, if you need more clarity. Fantastic. Thank you so much, You're June. You're welcome. Thanks for having for me. For coming to VAP Access. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm very thankful um, that you found time to come here yeah. on VAP well, Access. You said VIP. I'm like, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. These are the places I go. <laughs> Asante sana. Caribou. That was June Gashui from Nairobi, Kenya. A really dope intellectual property lawyer and musician, artist, um, just vibe curator, all round vibe amazing curator. individual. So please follow June. June Gashui on all her social media channels. You can follow JGIP Consultants. Yes. I got that right. Yes. And uh, get some advice. If you're an artist, please book an appointment with them. They're very professional and they might actually change um, your career. Thank you so much and be back next week. I'll have another amazing artist. Ciao. Bye. VIP Access Season 4 is proudly supported by the Australian High Commission.